All right, got a question here, and this is one of those. This was one of those afternoons for me where I thought I was, I had been on the right track, and I was working and getting everything finalized and finished up for the question that I had. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to go back because I want to make sure I get this question just right. And so I went back, and the question came in through our uh, through our uh, Google Voice uh, text. I went back and, and read it. I realized I had not read this question right. I had interpreted the question as a general question about uh, the cessation of spiritual gifts. But that's not what the question was. The question began with the assumption of the cessation of spiritual gifts and then moved to what subject, Bull? Demon possession. Demon possession. And so here I am an hour out, and I'm like, man, I have spent all this time, I've spent all this time working on this, and I have gone in the wrong direction. So fortunately, I have done a little study on demon possession and gathered up some material. So, but what I decided to do, because demon possession falls into the realm of the area of spiritual gifts, I want, I'll focus on demon possession um, and then move to the, gen, the more broad and general subject of spiritual gifts if we have time tonight. But, but we will focus on demon possession. So I'll get, I'll get it right. And uh, I appreciate this question because uh, this is, like so many other things, this is one of those questions that are, are, are one of these matters that people talk about and they just, they just completely miss it. Uh, it, it, for example, in any discussion of miracles, the, the misuse of the word miracle is just so rampant in our society uh, and, and in, in, in religious discussions that people use the word miracle to describe all kinds of things that aren't miracles. Uh, you know, the Bible is very specific. The Bible uses specific language to, to describe miracles, and they describe purpose for miracles, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But... In the same vein, now look, I understand sometimes we use the term or the concept of demon possession in a light, in a light-hearted way. Rhonda probably referred to Jeffrey as being demon possessed a number of times through the course of, of his younger days. Uh, or we might refer to somebody, uh, we might refer to a child as a little demon, and we we and we t and we talk, or or then you got on top of everything else, you know. The greatest cartoon of all time, Bugs Bunny, you know, and the Tasmanian Devil. You know, he you know runs around, twirls around like a tornado, and, and tears everything apart. And so we we have that terminology, but but then sometimes the terminology gets mixed in with other things. And you know, back in the 1970s, some of you may remember what year it was, but I'm thinking it was about 74. The movie The Exorcist came out, and it just took the world by storm. And it's a scary movie. It it draw you up. It gives me goosebumps. I see Dennis back there shaking the goosebumps off of him right now, just thinking about just thinking about Linda Blair and that and that movie, uh, The Exorcist. And then and then after that came a series of movies uh, with a little feller by the name of Damien. And he was a demon possessed child, and 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 so those those types of movies kind of had their kind of had their way uh, in the late seventies and early eighties. And, uh, and, uh, and when the exorcist came out, the subject of demon possession kind of became front and center in a lot of religious discussions. Uh, there are still a large number, there are still a large number of people in the religious world who believe in actual demon possession today. Uh, Roman Catholicism would be among that number. Uh, they still have, they still have uh, in their priesthood priests that are trained in the art of exorcisms. Uh, and those things are still practiced uh, in Catholicism today. Um, almost all of your uh, charismatic groups, your Pentecostals, uh, believe in some form of literal demon possession today. I've had a number of friends through the years that believe in, in literal demon possession today. And, and so the question is, does demon possession occur or does it exist today? Now, first of all, let me just say this. When we ask the question, does it exist today, we readily admit that it did exist at some time. You see? Just by asking the question, does it exist today, we recognize and, 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 and 
profess our faith in what the Bible says about the biblical record of demon possession, okay? And so we're, we readily admit that there was a time when, when, uh, when people were possessed, literally possessed by demons. But, that, but that's not the question. The question is, does it still exist today? And, uh, and so uh, with that in mind, let's look a little bit at, first of all, well, it's just like in any study of miracles, and this is where I always go. When you want to talk to me about miracles, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start looking at what miracles are in the New Testament. And I'm going to start looking at what happened in the days of the New Testament, and then you're going to have to tell me, am I seeing today exactly what I could see in the days of the New Testament? And if the answer is no, then we're going to have a problem about what constitutes a miracle. And the same thing, and the, by the way, and the same measure is perfectly acceptable and, and right in the matter of demon possession. So what do we find, what do we find in the matter of demon possession in the New Testament, and thus then will we compare it to what we see claimed in regard to demon possession today? So what do we know about demon possession today? Well, we know that demon possession oftentimes caused people to lose their physical abilities. Right? That, that uh, a, a person might be demon-possessed and lose the ability to speak. A person may be demon-possessed, by the way, in the New Testament, and lose the ability to hear. A person might be demon-possessed and lose the ability to see. And so we find that in, in, in some New Testament cases of demon possession, there was the loss of some physical faculty, whether to speak or to, or to hear uh, or to see. And, uh, and you can uh, find some of these, for example, in Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 22. Also, uh, that, uh, that demon possession caused people to injure themselves. You remember the, the, man, the man who had the son who was demon-possessed in Matthew 17? And it says, He cast him into the water and into the fire to destroy him. Now, again, we don't, you know, then it would be the question, do we see that uh, today? Um, that demon possession caused a number of, uh, uh, any number of other physical infirmities in Luke uh, 13 and in, uh, in verse uh, uh, 10. Uh, and, I don't, and I don't know uh, if this would be exactly a demon possession case because the language is not clear enough, but, but some believe it to be. The woman, that, that, and the Bible describes her as having a spirit of infirmity and could not lift herself up. And G Jesus healed her, and he described, he described this uh, malady, this infirmity, as being bound by Satan. Now, whether or not that was a demon possession or not but it, it is of some, of some discussion, but just, again, showing that demon possession caused people to have physical infirmities. And so, so these are, these are some, some um, marks. Oh, and by the way, and I, I, this one I, I shouldn't leave off for sure. In Luke 8, 26 to 36, demon possession caused madness, caused insanity, caused insanity. Uh, Luke uh, 8, 26 to 36. And so... Uh, and so these would be some marks of, of demon possession in the New Testament. Now, what do we find? What do we find in comparison to that today? In other words, when people are, when the claim is made today that people are demon possessed, do we see these things involved today? By the way, what do we also know about people who were demon possessed with regard to their physical strength? Super, not just strong, superhuman, superhuman strength, uh, uh, legion. You know, it said no man could bind him. No man could bind him. In other words, they put physical shackles, they put physical shackles and chains on that man, and he, he broke them just like Samson would, would, break, would break ropes in his day. You know, do we see that? 
No, we don't. We don't see that today uh, either. And so, uh, and so, it's it's good and right to compare what the Bible says about demon possession to what we see today. What do we see today with demon possession? Is it, yeah, speaking tongues or, or, or babbling, frothing at the mouth, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, any number of things. But, but again, nothing, nothing that resembles what we see in the pages of the New Testament. And, and, and here's another thing. It simply claimed that a person is demon-possessed, Right? In other words, when people want to talk about demon possession today or exorcisms today, it's simply nothing more than testimony. Does that make sense? In other words, there, there, there's not a mark or, or, or a characteristic by which we can measure this thing. It's just simply assumed that a person is demon possessed and therefore needs to be exorcised and then thus the claim is made the demon is cast out. One more thing about demons that I left off. Demons in the first century, demon-possessed people in the first century had the ability to reasonably and rationally communicate with other people. Is that right? Did not, did not the demon-possessed people talk to Jesus? And then when the demon spoke, the demon recognized Jesus. All right? I know who you are, the Son of the Most High God. And so the demons, the demons had rationality. In other words, they were not just, they were not just completely out of control, like we might say the Tasmanian devil, because even Legion, who had superhuman strength, uh, ran around naked among the tombs and cut himself with rocks, still rationally talked with the Lord Jesus. And so, and so again, that's another thing that we see in the New Testament that we do not see in, in what is claimed to be demon possession uh, today. Also this, now let me just say this. I should have said this at the outset. Um, among the skeptics and the infidels, obviously they reject any idea of demon possession. And they say, well, the people in the first century simply referred to, simply referred to mental illness as demon possession because they didn't understand it in that day. All right? Now, do we have an answer for that? Yes, we do. For example, in Matthew chapter 4. Look in Matthew chapter 4. The very last two, or the two of the last three verses, verses 23 and 24. Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments. Those that were demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Do you see the difference there? And if I'm not mistaken, the word there for epileptics is the word moonstruck. Has the idea, the, the connotation there is, is uh, and, and that's, a, by the way, that's just an old, that's just an old word that just simply means that they were, they were, uh, they were not in their right mind, you know, you know, like, when does a werewolf come out? Full moon, right? Everybody knows that. You know, so in other words, and so it was just, it was just, a, it was just a, a piece of terminology to describe people who were not in their right mind. But note that it is distinct. Lunatic. Lunatic. Okay, and, that, and that's the word. In other words, people who are not in their right minds but someone who is not in their right mind as a separate category from what? Demon possession. And so from the very outset, we find that, that mental illness and demon possession are recognized by the scriptures as being two totally separate things. 
All right, and so and so what we find again today is that, that people that might be somewhat out of their mind are said again to be demon possessed when in fact they have mental illness. You know, that confusion is today. That confusion was not in the days of the first of the first century. So now that we've established what it is, and we've established the manifestation of it, so now we ask the question: Does demon possession occur today? Now, <coughs> historically speaking, biblically speaking. We do not read, for the most part, about any idea of demon possession until the days of the New Testament. Have you ever given that any thought? That we do not read, uh, uh, there was what was called a melancholy spirit on Saul, King Saul, when he disobeyed the Lord there in, in uh, 1 Samuel 5, uh, actually before 15, when, uh, when he offered a sacrifice that he wasn't offer, authorized to give and a melancholy spirit came. But then that spirit was soothed by play, when David played music. Well, that doesn't sound like demon possession. No, you know, nobody played music in the New Testament when somebody was demon possessed. And so that wouldn't be a, that wouldn't be a good case uh, to make for Old Testament demon possession. Demon possession is one of those things that burst on the scene in the New Testament and disappeared just as fast as it appeared. It disappeared just as fast as it appeared. Have you ever given that any thought? Have you ever noticed that, that demon possession took place from the earliest days of the ministry of Christ, and then after about Acts 19, you never hear about it again. Remember, uh, Paul cast out, cast out the, 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 uh, the spirit out of that young girl that guys were, those men were using to make money. And, they, and it says their hope of profit or making money was gone, and that's why they threw Paul and Silas in prison. I said Acts 19, it's actually Acts uh, 16. But uh, after that, it's almost unheard of. Well, you do have the one instance where there was a demon-possessed man that the Jews tried, the six Jewish men tried to cast out. And what happened to them, Dennis? Jesus. That's right. Paul, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And then what did he do to them? He whooped all six of them and sent them running away naked. There's that superhuman strength. There's that superhuman strength. And so, but again, but note also the reasoning. I know Jesus. I know Paul. But who are you? And so, again, looking at, just looking at the situation itself doesn't lend itself to what is claimed, is claimed today. But, uh, but so... Uh, the, Bible, the Bible is clear about what it is, the manifestations of it, and then that also that, that it began with the advent of the ministry of Jesus. It began with the advent of the ministry of Jesus, and shortly after the death of Jesus, it began to, it began to wane and, and go away. But let's look, at, let's look at the incidents of, not of possession, but of exorcism. Okay, let's, look, let's move forward to the matter of exorcism. Uh, we know Jesus cast out demons, right? And that, now, was that a miraculous thing or a non-miraculous thing? It was a miraculous thing. To cast out a demon required a miraculous power, right? So when Jesus sent out the 70, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10. Look in Matthew chapter 10. And this is what is called the limited commission, where Jesus sends out the twelve to go and preach the gospel to the Jews. All right? And it says, uh, chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out. He gave them power to cast them out to heal all kind of sickness and all kind of disease. Isn't it interesting that that's almost the same phraseology that's used of Jesus right before the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 4? All kind of sickness and all kind of disease. And then, then it names the men in verses 2 to 4. And then it says in verse 7, As you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, Cast out demons. Freely you have received, 
freely give. So Jesus t gives them essentially unlimited miraculous power. Isn't that right? I mean, any kind of sickness, demon, whatever, whatever needed to be done, those men were given divine authority and power to carry out uh, those, uh, uh, those deeds as they went out and preached. But there's Matthew 10 and verse 8. Now, look over in the book of Luke, chapter 9. So we know that Jesus had the power, that Jesus had the power to uh, cast out demons. Now Luke 9, verse 1, is the parallel to that. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. All right? There, again, that's just what we just read in Matthew 10. I mean, yeah, Matthew 10. Now look at Luke 10. Turn the page and find Luke 10, and beginning in verse number 1. And after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also. And he sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And if you go on and read this list of what Jesus said to them... It's almost identical to the 12. You know, don't take any money with you. Don't take extra clothes. Don't take you know, a, a, a purse to carry money. Uh, don't take an extra pair of shoes. Go and preach and, and, and trust that the Lord will take care of you. He told, he told them the exact same thing. Now, in verse number, uh, in verse number 9 of Luke, of Luke 10, it says, and heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Now, I want to note, there is, there is no express reference early on to demon possession in this text. But Jesus did give them miraculous power, right? He said, go and heal the sick. Now, when they come back, Look at verse 17. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name, no, by your authority, by your power. And so even though it's not expressly mentioned in the early part of Luke 10, it's manifested in verse 17 after they got back that the 70 also had the power to cast out demons. So Jesus had the power to cast out demons. Jesus gave the 12 the power to cast out demons. Jesus gave the 70 the power to cast out demons. And then after that, the apostles gave other people the ability to cast out demons. Okay, so in other words, after the church was established and the apostles were uh, the apostles were the, the on earth authorities authority or as collective for the church, uh, we find that the apostles gave uh, these gifts. For example, in Acts chapter I believe it's Acts chapter six. In Acts chapter six, it doesn't mention it does not mention. Uh, uh, demons specifically, but the Bible says in Acts 6 and verse 8, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among, among the people. Uh, in Acts chapter 8, and uh, in verses number, in uh, verses 5, Philip, Philip was uh, one of, was one of the seven. In, from Acts 6, we talked about this morning that we're pointed over the business of the ministration to the widows. Verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria, preached Christ to them, and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. So here you have, here you have uh, Philip. One, what we call one of the original seven deacons, even though the Bible doesn't refer to them in that way. But the point is, is that this was a miraculous power. 
the ability to cast out demons was a miraculous power. Because it was a miraculous event, it required a miraculous power to deal with it. By the way, uh, uh, in, I believe it's in John chapter 9. I didn't write this down, so I'm going to run off memory. I believe it was in John chapter 9 where uh, um, James and John said to Jesus, we found somebody casting out demons in your name, but we rebuked him because he didn't walk with us. And what did Jesus say? Leave him alone. Said, if he's doing that, then he's what? He's with us. You know, nobody does that unless he's with us. And so you're probably dealing in that particular situation with one of the 70 that the apostles saw casting out demons, but them not knowing that situation rebuked, rebuked those men, okay? And so, uh, and so again, here's again, somebody else with the miraculous ability to cast out, uh, cast out demons. So then the question is, does demon possession happen today? Well, we would have to ask this question. Is there the ability to perform the miraculous today? And the answer to that question is no. So if the, if the miraculous has been done away with today, and by the way, that was where I was preparing when I realized I'd done the wrong question. If the, if the ability to perform the miraculous does not exist today, then demon possession cannot exist today because it requires the miraculous in order to cast out a demon. Does that make sense? If, demon, if, if, in other words, if the miraculous does not exist today, and it doesn't, but demon possession did exist, then the devil would have an undue advantage over Christians today because he would be able to do things that the Christians that Christians could not undo. And so just, just on the basis of the fact that demon exorcism or the exorcism of demons was a miraculous power because that is the fact and that is the case and that power is no longer in existence today, then the demon possession has to also go away. Now, Remember what I said? Remember what I said about when demon possession started and when it finished, right? It it just burst out of almost burst out of nowhere at the ministry of Jesus and then all but died out when? After the establishment of the church, right? You just see it waning. Turn in your Old Testament to the book of Zechariah, chapter 13. I saw you raise your hand back there. I knew where you were going. I knew what you were doing, Johnny. You ain't fooling. Just to support that, every bit of that. Yeah. But I couldn't let you steal my thunder. <laughs> Look in Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13. This is the next to the last book of the Old Testament. Now in chapter 12 and verse 10, there is a reference to the piercing of the Son of Man. The house of David. Now, who is that talking about? Jesus. That's right. Jesus is the one of the house of David. It says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Which, by the way, that passage is cited in the New Testament. Okay? So that's a reference to Jesus. The one whom they pierced. Then you get to verse 1 of chapter 13. In that day. In other words, in that general time span, in that day, in that time frame, the time frame of the piercing, something's going to happen. It says, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. What is the fountain for sin that was opened up? The blood of Christ. And, and when was that fountain open? When they, pierced his side. when they pierced his side and therefore came out blood and water. All right? That was the fountain for sin that was open. And so in that day, a fountain for sin and uncleanness is going to be opened. And then look at verse 2. And also in that day, says the Lord, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land and they shall no longer be remembered 
I will also cause, get this, the prophets and the unclean spirits to depart out of the land. Now note, prophets is on the good side and unclean spirits is on the bad side, right? But both will be what? Gone. At what time? During, that, during the same time. You see? During the same time. So whatever time frame that there was when the piercing and the fountain for sin was open, also at that time the prophet said, prophecy is going to go away and demon possession is going to go away. And that would take me to where I had intended to start with the matter of the miraculous. You know, when, did the, you know, when did the time of the miraculous cease? Well, it ceased when the scriptures were revealed, right? And, we'll, and, and I, don't, I, don't, I really don't even want to introduce this, but I am just going to introduce the thought, and then we'll come back to it. But whatever good thing, whatever good thing was done in the miraculous sense, and whatever thing was done that was bad in the miraculous sense, was done away with at the same time. And so the Bible says, when that which is perfect is come, that which is done in part shall be done away. And Hebrews thir uh, he was in 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 8, prophecy, knowledge, tongues, all of those things are described as being done in part. And they'd be done away when that which is perfect or complete is come. Which all, and then just by way of introduction, what was the purpose? What was the primary purpose of mir of the miraculous? Testimony of Christ and His authority, and to confirm what? But I mean, but for the apostles, why did why did why was the, right? Yeah, it confirmed it confirmed the authority of, of their message. Now, you know, anybody can go out and say, Jesus told me this, Jesus told me that. Anybody can do that. The question is, can you prove it? Yeah, that's right. And so, you know, and people are running around all over the world right now saying, Jesus told me this, Jesus told me that. But they ain't doing nothing. They're not doing nothing like the apostles did. They're not doing anything like, like uh, the, the early church did. No, it's, they confirmed their message through the working of the miracles. By the way, Mark 16 says that expressly. The Lord worked with them, confirming the word with the accompanying signs. Confirming the word. And that's exactly where I was going next, Wade, is that there was no Bible for those people in those days. So far as the gospel was concerned, all there was was the oral, what we would call the oral tradition. Then later on, Paul and other apostles began to write these things down. But even then, it took a long time for those things to be copied and then disseminated throughout the world. And if you remember, last Sunday night, we talked about you can trust your Bible. And I showed you, I believe it was the Sinaiticus, was, was the oldest New Testament. And it dated to the, the early 4th century, which tells us by the early 4th century, the Bible had been copied enough and distributed enough that people knew what belonged in the Bible. And so as the Bible continued to be written and it continued to be copied and it continued to be dispersed throughout the world, that was the, that was the confirmation. And the miraculous was not the confirmation. And you can see, uh, you can see how that would work, that as, as the miracles or as, as the word of God increased, the need for miracles decreased. And then you have this, and we'll talk about this next week as well. How did people perform miracles? When you get past Jesus and the apostles, how did people receive miraculous gifts? There was Jesus who had the power. That's right. The, the power of the Holy Spirit was given by the laying on of the apostles' hands. Acts chapter 8, Simon the sorcerer. You know, Phil, by the way, remember, Philip's in Samaria. Philip's preaching. Philip's performing miracles. People are believing the gospel. People are being baptized. And yet, the Bible says what? They called for Peter and John, 
to come and lay hands on them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Why didn't Philip do it? He didn't have the power to do it. And then Simon the sorcerer saw that. He said... Right, he didn't, yeah, he didn't have the power to pass the gift. That's right. He could heal you, but he, did, he didn't have the power to give you the power to heal. And so the Bible says, And when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Why didn't he ever offer Philip any money? He knew he couldn't give it to him. And so he offered the apostles' money. He says, Give me also this power, that on whom I lay my hands, they may receive the Holy Spirit. Of course, Peter gave him a pretty stern rebuke over that. But the illustration for us is Philip didn't have the power to pass it on. And if it was just simply given by prayer, then there was no need to call for Peter and John to come down from Jerusalem to Samaria. Actually, it'd be up, be up on the map, but it'd be down geography-wise because Jerusalem's on a mountain, all right? But you know, if, it, if, if Philip could have passed it on, they didn't need Peter and John. If it, if it came uh, through prayer, then they didn't need Peter and John. But the Bible's clear. They called Peter and John to come down and lay their hands on them that they might receive uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And, so, and then also Paul said to the Romans in, in, in the very opening lines of his letter to the church at Rome, he says, I desire to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. That's Romans chapter 1 and verse number 11. Why, you know, why would Paul need to go to Rome? If, if somebody that was already there had the power, which they did because Paul talked about miraculous gifts in Rome, in Romans chapter 12. Some of them had miraculous gifts in Rome. Then why did Paul need to go to impart? Because those people couldn't pass it on. And prayer wasn't good enough. And the Holy Spirit just wasn't doling it out, you know, you know, like kids throwing out candy at the Christmas parade. Because that's how some people seem to think that the Holy Spirit's giving the gifts, you know, that he's just rolling down the middle of the street on, on a fire truck, throwing the spiritual gifts out like, like Smarties and bubble gum at the Christmas parade. Well, if that's the way that it was done, why did Peter and John have to come from Jerusalem? And why did Paul want to go to Rome? And so the, the, power, the power of the gifts died when the last person who had a, apostolic hands laid on them died. Had to be somebody associated with John. As, as best we know, John, and we know, and, and we have the indication that John was far and away the youngest of the 12 apostles. And he probably lived until the early 90s, early 90s. Whereas Paul died before A.D. 70, James was killed early on, you know, in, in Acts chapter 12. You know, Herod killed James. Uh, the rest of the apostles uh, dispersed, as best we can tell, at some point dispersed throughout uh, the world. By the way, that's just, secular, that's just secular history. But, you know, if John lived in the time of Christ and, and John lived till he was, say, 90 years old, you know, and let's just say, you know, and that was in the late 90s. You know, if he laid his hands on another 18-year-old and that, and that one lived to be 90, that's just another 70 years beyond John. That only gets you to about the year 160. Yeah, and then it's done. And, and by the way, John spent his last years on the island of Patmos. You know, they weren't, they weren't, and, and they weren't parading hundreds of people through the Isle of, Isle of Patmos for John to lay hands on them. You know, he, he was there for a reason. He was being punished. He was in isolation. And so, and so when the last person died that had the laying on of apostolic hands, with that person, the gift also died. I mean, there's, there's, no, other way to, there's no other way around that. There's no other way around that. And so, and so we know at best the apostolic gifts died before the end of the second century before the end of the second century. And yet we also know that by that same time, the Bible had been written, copied, and passed, scattered throughout the whole world. 
And so therefore, the miraculous was not required to confirm the word because the Bible was there to confirm the word. And we'll, in our next session, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that and look at some of the discrepancies uh, in, in respect to that. Uh, uh, that'll be on, uh, on, the, on the 25th because next Sunday night is, is a singing night. But uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But demon possession can't be possible. It's, it's a miraculous event. And, and the gift of the miraculous is gone. And God, God, has never left his, God has never left his people at a disadvantage against the devil, ever. There, there's never been a time when, when God's people cannot overcome the power and the influence. And if he can possess people today, we can't cast them out. We're at his mercy, not him being at ours, right? By the way, and the devil is at our mercy in that sense, right? Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. That's right. Demon possession on the rise in the United States. It's a pandemic. I wonder if they'll make a mask for that. If they do, I won't wear it. <laughs> All right. Any questions? Demon mask. <laughs> I'm an idiot. <laughs> What's that? You're probably right, yeah. I might market me a demon mask. All right. All right, if there's no questions, I appreciate everybody being here tonight. Let me uh, turn this off. I probably should have turned it off before I declared to the world I was an idiot. Of course, everybody watched.